This is the Hot Take Hockey Podcast with your hosts, Lucas and John Viveros. Hey everyone, it's John here from Hot Take Hockey with Lucas for episode 22 of the Hot Take Hockey Podcast. Good chats on the way. We had a great guest last week, Sid Sixero. Good chat. Uh, he went on a couple of little rants there, got the comments fired up, and we won't go too much into it, but obviously there's a lot of other things that have happened where uh, Sid got ripped for, for a clip pretty heavy, so uh, that happened, and obviously back and forth a little bit, positive and negative, uh, gave us some extra maybe attention on our pod, but uh, Lucas, man, hockey news, a lot going on. Uh, how are you doing? And just, uh, yeah, what's up? Doing well, buddy. Doing well. I mean, now that we're in that second half of the season, it's it's really seeing what teams uh, are going to match up with with other clubs to to play in the first round. Looking at those first round matchups, looking ahead to trade deadline, like we were talking about off air, and 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 seeing you know some of these big pieces where they're going to go. I mean, I'm excited, man. I'm rejuvenated, ready for the second half, and uh, yeah, ready to talk some hockey here. I mean, why don't we kick it off with in related to Sid Six Arrows rant last week. The Canucks. I know we probably don't want to spend the whole pot on it or anything like that, but just no. uh, just announced Bruce Boudreaux was let go. Rick Tockett brought in like everybody expected weeks and weeks ago. John, uh, what's your what's your initial reaction? I know you made a video on it too. Yeah, yeah. I dropped a couple of videos. Yeah, yeah, guys, we're not gonna spend too much time. I just I think with the Canucks situation, it's ongoing, and obviously we're just gonna be forced to continue to talk about it because they'll. There's going to be trades. There's going to be news that comes out. So uh, for this episode, because I already made the videos and I feel like we've already talked about it enough, I'll just put it out there that, yeah, it was disrespectful. I feel like they handled it in such a mess way. Like the fact that they actually called him into a meeting the morning of, it's like, what am I walking into here? <laughs> like Boudreaux knew it all along. He, he appeared yeah. on morning shows. Like the guy was like, there was no surprises here. He was shocked that he was even there for that long. But uh, yeah, Lucas, anything else that we didn't talk about in the Sid chat? Like, I just feel like all of it's come out now. It, it's done. It, it happened. Yeah. yeah now I, I think forward. I think with the, you know, last weekend's events, um, I haven't really touched on it yet. So just, just from my perspective, I think it was, yeah, like you said, John, totally disrespectful. And Bruce Boudreaux multiple times would leave media scrums and just say, hope I see you tomorrow. Or like, yeah. it just became a bit of a joke. I mean, a huge joke, really. Um, and Rick Tockett, obviously going from the TNT panel to now the coach of the Canucks. We'll see where this goes. Um, I think that Rutherford thinks he's got his guy now. And we'll see what this turns into. But I still see the Canucks being a bit of a tire fire for the rest of the season and really needing a reset um, starting next season. I think this is uh, this season's pretty much done for them. Unless Tockett can somehow light a fire on, under their ass. Uh, for them to go on a huge winning streak. I, I don't see anything good yeah. coming out of Vancouver for the rest of the way. Uh, but in, as far as Boudreaux being let go, I think it's it's better for all parties now. And I hope we see Bruce Boudreaux somewhere in media, man. I would love to see the guy. Like, imagine a clean swap with talk. He just goes to TNT. Like, that would be sick. I'd love to see him. There. Yeah, I'd be down for that. I know a lot of people yeah. have discussed that. I know yeah. a lot of people on Leafs Twitter have discussed. Just bring him in as like that Paul, McQu um, Paul McClain equivalent. Oh, yeah. Like, get him behind the scenes. Get him up in the press or whatever it is with the Leafs. Uh, so Paul McClain, uh, that kind of role he was doing could be a Bruce Boudreaux fit. Uh, but I was also going to say, people talk about it all the time. It's like re recycling the old boys club. And these guys now in Vancouver, were all together at Pittsburgh. So Patrick Alvin, Jim Rutherford, and Rick Tockett were all uh, on that Penguins team. And then I think Tockett left the bench and then Sergey Gonchar came in the following year. I'm pretty sure. Correct me if I'm wrong mm -hmm. in the comments, guys. Mm -hmm. nope. So yep. like, Four guys in the picture of Vancouver now when the, within a few years there were all with Pittsburgh. But yeah, that's just kind of how it goes sometimes. So we'll see how it works. We'll see what the chemistry uh, brings. But I don't think too much, at least in the near future, can fix this Vancouver Canucks situation uh, too much outside of what you just said, the Bruce Boudreau like momentum effect. Maybe they go on a stretch of winning games. But like in terms of actually fi fixing this situation, it's not going to happen overnight. No. Uh, so yeah, we can just move past that. I honestly, I feel like every time I get into the Canucks, it's just rambling on because there's so much <laughs> you can discuss. There's so much yeah. to go over that there's like no cap on it. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's chat all-star stuff and yep. just big names on the board. Uh, I don't feel like maybe, maybe you feel differently, Lucas. I, I feel like a lot of people are trying to pull snubs out of the equation and obviously different conversations now, like everyone was complaining about Cole Caulfield. He is done for the year now. Uh, but I feel like even, especially in the Atlantic, like, were there really sure there were snubs, but there were there really guys that you could be like, all right, 
they're way ahead or like definitely a big time miss? I think that, what was voted in at least. Yeah. I really don't think there was really big, big time misses. I think there's guys that you absolutely could make a case that they should be there. Maybe over a guy like we talked on last week's pod, maybe, or maybe over a guy that, you know, is on a lesser team that shouldn't be there, but because of the rules that are enforced with a, with an all-star per team that caps, you know, the team size. And so, yeah. you know, an example that I look at too, when you, when you look at the Atlantic, um, you know, maybe William Nylander really does deserve to be there. It's his best season of his career. Yeah. But when you're going to do that, are you not going to have Austin Matthews there and not have one of the biggest stars uh, in hockey at the event? I mean, that's tough. That's a tough sell. But obviously, these were all fan votes, according to the NHL. So all these guys that did get fan voted in, the last three on each team, you can't really argue it because the fans voted it in, at least according to the league. So I, I don't want to uh, speculate on – because I know there's there's whole all these rabbit holes on are these votes legit and whatever. I mean, let's let's give the league the benefit of the doubt that these that these voting votes were legit. Um, and I think that the three guys on each team, for the most part, I mean, deserve to be there. You look at Matthews, Marner, Vasilevsky. You look at um, Rantanen, McKinnon, Hellebuck, like Dreisaitl, obviously, like – I think that overall it's really a non story. And I think for the most part, the three guys that got voted in on each team really do deserve to be there. Yeah. That's kind of what I was feeling. I just think, yeah, it's limited spots as it is. And back yeah. to that Nylander conversation. Sure. I, but I think Matthews season continues to be like overlooked. Of course, he's not having it to that standard, but just because, I mean, it's Austin Matthews. I just think you have to have him there. Uh, mm-hmm. It's kind of a balance. Like it's, you want the best players this season, but you also like Matthews is right there in the conversation with a lot of things. And uh, I do think uh, that was the right call. Um, but as we said, like the guys that I pointed out, at least like Pasternak, Horvat, Dreisaitl, like down the list, I don't think they had this huge miss. Uh, the only one that I kind of looked at and I was just like, really, is that the best option was Stuart Skinner. But then you think about division versus division and yeah. Stuart Skinner has been one of, if not the better goalies in the Pacific division, like, Obviously, the second half of the Pacific is pretty weak. So, I mean, you could go. Then you're just going apples, you know, apples to apples with like a Marty Jones or something, and and then yeah. you know, and then the same debate will happen. Exactly. Yeah. So, I, I think I I do want to point out though that uh, Jay Fresh Hockey on Twitter he did post um, uh, an image of all of the players that should be there if there was no cap, if there was no rule on having a player per team. Yeah. As, and, I'm a big fan of this idea um, because then you have guys like Rasmus Dahlin who really should be there um, getting in and uh, you don't have a Montreal Canadian there. Sorry, Habs fans, your team's not very good this year. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation, right? So I don't think we'll ever see the league move to this because I think they want a player from each team and to bring all fans. the eyes, to right? Yeah. right? They want the eyes. But, but I did want to shout out Jay Fresh Hockey for putting that together because it, it, it was a cool, uh, cool uh, piece of work there. No, 100%. And I think what you just said is so key. Like, sorry, house fans again, but directed towards house fans, it's like having Suzuki in and, and not having Suzuki in makes the world of a difference in terms of house fans watching. Like, mm-hmm. and think about the the size of the Montreal Canadiens fan base, one of the biggest in the NHL. So you take the house player out of that equation and a lot of people are just sitting there going, yeah, I don't care to watch it this year mm-hmm. or I don't care to watch it tonight. So that's the big part. We can complain all we want, but we have to look at it in that perspective, especially when major markets are not doing as well that season, uh, especially like two teams like Chicago and uh, Montreal, even though Seth Jones, I, I, I don't think that was the best candidate, but no. uh, Chicago obviously is having it tough this year. So yeah, yeah just in terms of all-star, we, I mentioned Caulfield, Lucas, I know we were going to talk about it. So Caulfield out for the year, Josh Norris out for the year. And who am I missing here? Max oh, Pacioretty. Max Pacioretty out for the year. So, yeah. Wow. I mean, the Pacioretty, I, I think the Caulfield one come, came out of nowhere, but I think the more so disappointing ones here, Norris and Pacioretty, because of, well, the Sens trying to get back in the conversation, but Pacioretty's road, man, like, and especially Carolina being a cup contender, two massive situations. We just talked off about the uh, Pearson and that rehab not going well. And now him having to go through another thing, like it seems like it's happening a lot right now with different teams. Yeah. Max Pacioretty is, is definitely a sad one. And we'll, we'll focus on that one here to start. I think that him coming back from that Achilles injury and, you know, all the work that he did to get back and for him only to play, I think it is, I think it was four games. Uh, yeah, um, and, and, yeah. and, and with that last game, like the way the injury went down for him to, to sever that other, Ach- the Achilles again, 
Um, it's just fluke, man. Like it's so sad to watch because it's one of those things you you wonder what could have been done to prevent it. And the only thing that I can even think of is maybe being more cautious on his return. But yeah. other other than that, man, it, it's just a fluke accident, and it sucks because he's obviously in the later stage of his career. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think he has a contract next year. So he's he's no, I think, depending like, on so really tough situation. Yeah. So like, what happens in a situation like that when the off season are, comes around and he's not signed by Carolina? Yeah, it it really sucks even more so. Like. Because for some of these players, the journey to make it back is just so tough. Like you're on a constant grind, like there's just no stopping. And then just to get only a couple of games in. And then it kind of reminds me, obviously different sport and different situations, but like similar thing happened to Clay Thompson, not as like close of a range, but I remember Clay like spent like basically the whole season coming back then trained through the off season just to get it re-injured in the mm-hmm. preseason to miss yep. basically the whole season again. He missed most of the season. So patch ready now little bit of a different timeline and more close together here because he literally just got back. Mm-hmm. Now he's like bare minimum. He's going to be out until the fall again, basically, yep. or the summer yep. or fall. Right. Yeah. If it's to that extreme. So such a disappointing thing. Uh, I think, yeah, kind of what you said, like maybe more of a fluke. I, we really don't know what happened behind the scenes. Like if more could have been done, but it, it did seem like for the most part, uh, he was never going to be back until, February, March. So maybe, maybe there's the questions of, did they bring him back too early? Because I do remember back at the start when it was announced, it was going to be kind of that February, March timeline Yeah, came back in January. So maybe it was a little premature, but what do you think about the Josh Norris one? Cause this one, like even sense fans were super confused. I was, I was watching like them see Ridley Gregg get called up and they were thinking like, okay, the sense are going to change things up, but that was more so they're calling him up because he's done. Josh Norris is done for the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really seemed, as you said off air, like, they were timing it to, to to bring him back towards the end of the season and avoid surgery just to now have surgery. Yeah. It, it seemed like from an outside perspective, again, not being not overly covering that market. It, it seems like from an outside perspective, they wanted to rehab him to get him back um, uh, because they thought they could get him back before the end of the season. And funny, funny enough, John, like you said off air, that they would be, you know, a, a contender for a playoff spot, right? And that's they really wanted to add him in as they were hitting their stride in, I don't know, February, March, April. And that's what the Sens do a lot. I mean, the Sens we've yeah. seen in the past, like even last year uh, and the year before, I believe, it's like the pesky Sens conversation starts happening towards the end of the season, and maybe it still happens. Who knows? Even without Norris, but it usually they get their role going towards the end of the season and make things interesting a little bit or competitive. Um, mm-hmm. But things have been sliding away from them quite a bit. Yeah, but you almost feel like if there was a chance to for this to happen, like for him to have to go through surgery, it, it, it is the only option. Why take a risk on such a cornerstone of the franchise? Um, I get the short-sighted thinking at the beginning because you're thinking, you know, obviously Ottawa management thought that this season was going to look a lot different and it hasn't thus far. But just with a guy that's so important to your long-term success, it is interesting that they elected to go the rehab route until they were now forced to do the surgery. I mean, it could also be Josh Norris's decision t- decision too, right? He might have uh, chose that as well. But uh, it is an unfortunate one, and 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 you know, taking the the human side out of it, looking from a fantasy perspective, because I know John, we like to do that on this show sometimes. Look yeah. through a fantasy perspective with Pacioretty and Josh Norris. Both of these guys were hidden gems for your fantasy team to stash them, and now you've stashed them for all this time for essentially zero return. I mean, Pacioretty, you got a few little points, but Josh Norris, you got nothing. So. Um, yeah, it's interesting balancing those two things, um, but unfortunate for both guys that they got, they're out for the rest of the season and we'll see, uh, when they come back in, in the, in the fall, hopefully. Yeah. All the best to those guys. That's, that's really tough. And then even for Caulfield, I know everyone wants to make the comments on like, oh, this is making their case strong for Bedard. Uh, but yeah, Caulfield, I honestly leave fan perspective. Like I, I wanted to see him the rest of the year and see what he was doing. Cause he was kind of ripping it up and on a on a team that's not doing well. Uh, Mm -hmm. But yeah, back to Saturday quick, Lucas connecting. We're connecting a bunch of different conversations here. So the Leafs lose to Laval and uh, the Laval Rockets funny. Yeah. You know what? I think uh, I, I took a nice 24 hours and I was sitting there and going, well, weren't we just talking about Bedard to Montreal and that's going to be a stronger case with no Caulfield? Well, 
Good, good win, Montreal. You took yourself farther away from Bedard. <laughs> no, I'm, thank, I'm thanks for giving us the point. Thanks for us. Thanks yeah, for we got a pity one, point. Right? The Leafs love yeah. the pity point, right? The Leafs yeah. love the pity point, and Montreal got themselves farther away from Bedard. Maybe it's all the worst thing ever. <laughs> Loser mentality, folks. Loser mentality. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I just quickly, man. What do you think of that game? I think they they dominated them in the first period. I mean, it, it looked like boys against men that whole first period. And I uh, I looked over to uh, the uh, the family I was watching with on the couch, and I said, "Man, the Leafs the Leafs should run these guys out of the building. Like this should be a six seven seven goal performance." And it looked like it was going to go that way, John. Like in the in the first period, like they should have had three or four goals in the first. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they just got completely outplayed in the second. And I'm pretty sure in the third, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, Montreal didn't have a shot until like five six minutes left like they were stuck yeah, on I don't 23 know when it was. shots I there was a gap there was a gap they were stuck sure. on 23 shots for like 20 in-game minutes almost like it was it was absurd um but you just knew like you just knew that uh montreal was gonna find a way to win that game you just knew uh, josh anderson's such a leaf killer I'll, I'll own it every time because yeah i mean anderson's goal and the habs uh crawl their way back but yeah just pff, what a garbage goal like i'm not gonna put it on sam sold because he's been so good lately but just a short side rem pit lick, random wrister that that wins the game like so random. So I was random. expecting I was expecting like a Suzuki or Anderson like highlight real goal, but yeah, just a random pit lick wrister. So yeah, it's whatever. It's like, the storylines never change. The Leafs play down to their opponents, even though they yeah. were dominating at times. But it, it's the same old story. And for me, like I said last week on the on the show, I think I finally accepted that uh, Boston's out of reach. I I finally accepted it now, everybody. The Leafs are coming second or third in their division. Boston is too far gone at this point. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think we got to start flipping the mentality. If if yeah. everyone wants to just admit that Toronto and Tampa are playing together, then like I'm down for that. Yeah. But Lucas, I'll, I'll flip it on the other side. Like, I think we're more so now just hoping that Tampa goes through a rough patch and one of Florida or Buffalo go on a miracle run. And I am much more confident of the Leafs against either of those teams, even though. Again, playing down to their opponents. Who knows? The Sabres, I could see that that happening because it happened against Montreal. But uh, I now there's more of a chance of that happening versus the Leafs catching Boston. Oh, I would agree. Yeah. I, I would agree. I would agree. But I will still say, come on. I, I just they're don't see Tampa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're playing. playing the Bulls. So let's, I'm, the Bulls. I'm accepting it. I'm accepting it. I, I mean, if I'm wrong, great. But they're playing the Bulls. <laughs> All right. So continue to connect the conversations. Yep. What do the Leafs need to do to beat the Bolts? Well, Elliot Freeman, I think over the weekend, cited that the Blue Jackets are giving Gavrikov permission to speak to teams on a potential extension. He is going to be a big trade deadline target. And Freeman outlined the two teams, or two of the teams, sorry, that are interested are the Oilers and Leafs. So, Lucas, man, is Gavrikov a target you like? I mean, he's got a little bit of an edge to him. Not that right shot guy, but a guy that you can fit into the top four, kind of what they're missing maybe with Muzzin, less experienced though. Uh, is Gavrikov the guy? Do you think Evan Tetron could be uh, teams there, or are you looking at someone else? I like the idea of Gavrikov. I like the player Gavrikov. You know, I, I've always liked the way he plays, and he's got that snarl, and he blocks a lot of shots, and and the defensive responsibility he brings, uh, and the tenacity he brings. Having said that, John, like I've just been on this wagon recently of I don't think the Leafs have to do much on the blue line. Like I would just. I don't want to use assets and valuable cap space yeah. to address the blue line. I would much rather do that up front. So if Gavrikov comes in at, you know, a mid round pick or a very mid level prospect, I mean, maybe it's appealing, but if it starts getting ridiculous and there's multiple buyers in there, I just don't see the value um, for the least perspective, because I think that they need to add that top six guy or that third line C. Um, yeah. But that's where I sit on it. I, I've been very comfortable with the Leafs D for a while now. Like I, I don't think the Leafs D uh, as currently constructed uh, is necessarily a problem or needs to be upgraded. I see maybe one piece coming in that can help them. And maybe that is Gavrikov. But if it, if it overextends uh, what you have to deal, um, I don't think so. What about you? Yeah, I think it really depends on yeah what you said assets given up. Like I wouldn't give up more than like a second and maybe middle of the pack prospect. Like there's yeah. no chance you're giving up the first, especially with the the recent history of trades with the Blue Jackets. You're not trading a first to Columbus again. You're just not. 
Uh, the other one that was popped up into conversations is the Leafs. I think it was Sarah Valley or Johnson, one of those guys throughout that the Leafs have interested and they have been interested in uh, Jake McCabe from mm-hmm. Chicago. Uh, that's a guy that has that already uh, further cap down the line. So I think it's two more years at $4 million per. Uh, so that could be a, like a similar comparable to Gavrikov for an extension. I could see like them pulling like longer term. He's 27, so maybe you sign him four per longer after this. Uh, but Jake McCabe is the one that's more interesting for me because I think last year they brought in the Labushkin type and I Jake, I think Jake McCabe's more capable on the back end in other aspects than the Labushkin is. But if we know one thing from Jake McCabe, he likes laying out the hits and I think Lee fans would love, uh, McCabe on the team as well. So Gavrikov and McCabe. Yeah. If there's a defense target, I like those kind of styles in terms of defense targets, but I'm with you. If you're going to give up the assets of like a Nyes or a first or any of those, the only defenseman I would throw in that conversation would be like a Chikrin, if mm-hmm. if it's possible. But if yeah. not, to me, the targets are like a Timo Meyer or guys like that where yeah. you're throwing out yeah. the real assets. Because yeah. did you see Timo Meyer drop the gloves against Brandon? Oh Crow? yeah, buddy, <laughs> I want that guy so bad, man. Wow. And Imagine everyone's talking him. about the qualifying offer, like the 10 million qualifying offer. Here's yeah. the thing: if the trade was to happen, or or Dubis would pursue that kind of trade, one of two things would happen here: he would either look at it as just a rental. And then make enough space where you can at least just give the guy the qualifying offer. I don't think Meyer would accept the qualifying offer unless he realizes that, like, if he if he's getting moved, I should say. Like, I don't think he's just gonna yeah. straight out accept it. So what I'm saying is, like, I think Dubis would either just do it as a rental, or he would try to facilitate an extension with Timo Meyer ahead of time and ask the Sharks the same way other guys are are, are doing. So. Um, I don't know. The Myers definitely a dream scenario. I know we talked about it with Omar. I, I don't think it's the, as realistic, but uh, I do think Lucas, based on what I've seen and based on what insiders are talking about, the Leafs will probably make two moves and it'll probably come from each position, but I'm hoping yeah. for two, two moves on the, on the forward group, because I think they really could use a, an upgrade, not just in the top six, but also the bottom six. Like I'm looking at that bottom six. So if you get the top six edition, you can slide your crow down. So that immediately improves your bottom six. Yeah. I still think you need another guy in there. I, I really, mm-hmm. I like McMahon. I like Holmberg. To me, they're not the sexy choices for offense in the playoffs. They're just not. They're reliable based on what I've seen so far. Uh, but past like Yarn Crow and, and maybe if Kerfoot can <laughs> provide some secondary scoring, uh, I just don't like Angval and Kerfoot being your main secondary scorers. I just don't like it. So uh, I'm with you. I think the defensemen like McCabe, and defensemen like Gavrikov could be a great addition. And if they can make it work asset wise, awesome but uh definitely a couple forwards would be my targets yeah i like i actually do like mccabe i think he's a lot more appealing to me than gavrikov because he's got that cost control where he's on the team a few more years yeah um and i think that uh he would slot in perfectly what concerns me is that you already had rasmus sandin uh you know complaining about his lack of opportunity before the season started so how does that all come to play will be interesting if the leafs acquire mccabe um as well, well so people are to... talking about right like if you yeah. make a kind of, if you make a trade for a defenseman you're probably looking at one of like hall or sandine to be on their way out i would imagine because again i go back to the timmons conversation of what omar was saying yeah. the way timmons has been playing at least individually I, he didn't play well with riley that one night but like yeah. even that pass to yarn crow i don't know if that was on purpose or not but he's just been playing well so i just feel like having timmons and and ben as your depth already like if you bring in another guy I don't know how you someone's can... got to go out. Yeah. Someone's and I don't want them to trade Lilligren. I don't even want them to trade Sandine, to be honest. I think those two guys are future, like yeah. the now and the future. So that just, I hate being on the hallway getting to be out of there, but you're not it, trading Riley. You're not trading Brody. If you don't yep. trade Sandine Lilligren and you keep those death guys, I just said, who, who's on their way out. Who's going out. It, it has Fernando's to be not going anywhere. <laughs> well, like you said, it has to be, it has to be uh Sandine or hall and Sandine. Just trading him now, like you said, I, I don't think it makes the most sense. I think he is the a part of the future here. So that one's interesting. But you know what I was thinking about, John? When I was watching a bit of Blues Blackhawks on the weekend, and I was watching Jake McCabe, imagine if the Leafs were to get Jake McCabe and Max Domi from the Hawks. I know Jake McCabe and Brian McCabe, there's no relation there. But just a Mc- and, and Jake McCabe comes in. And he and he puts on that twenty four. If if twenty four is, I don't think twenty four is used yet. Puts on that twenty four, and Max Domi. I know it's some dreaming, buddy, but just there would be like Domi boomers, McCabe. <laughs> there'd be boomers in the streets just thinking, "Is that Brian McCabe's son? 
We got Max Domi's son and Brian McCabe's son. This is crazy. Like we're, we're riding the clock here. I mean, I would think it would, be, it would just be a cool little uh, callback. Yeah, but, again, as but, Lucas said, they're but, not related. But, they're not. But, but, they're not related. But Max, but Domi, Max Domi is yeah. obviously Ty's son. And I think yeah. Max Domi, like I said on the episode with Tic Tac, Tomar, Max Domi, I think, is that guy that could get added as a, as a bottom six uh, scoring forward. Just some punch in the bottom six. I like it because it also brings the, the physicality. Max Domi is not what he once was, but I think – um, you know, when the Leafs brought in Galchenyuk, that that worked uh, obviously in a different role, but that worked. They they made this weird piece fit. Yeah. I could see Max Domi being really rejuvenated to come in and play for Toronto. But uh, yeah, those are those are some of the targets we're looking at for sure. It's interesting to see John just another conversation regarding Sandine and Lilligren, like how they've just evolved in completely different ways. I think a lot of Leaf fans had Sandine, um, you know as the better prospect over Lilligren and Lilligren has just blossomed. I feel like into this defenseman that is yeah, like, oh, you can't that, move. That's that what I was talking. Yeah. I don't know who I was talking to the other night, but yeah, it's, it is crazy. The flip. Yeah. Cause I swear Lee fans like three years ago, were willing to throw Lilligren away for like a rental. Yeah. Like, I think crazy. I might've been in there. So I'll just be honest <laughs> in a minute, like big mistake on my part. Um, but yeah, they, they really have flipped as far as, Nick Robertson goes and, and, and that, I know we talked about him uh, on the last show and, and him being shut down. It's unfortunate. And I think the Leafs, uh, they, they could have used him as a trade chip. I just don't see that happening now with the injury and his value is obviously an all time low. So uh, just wanted to wish that guy well again. I know we did on the last show, but yeah. hoping that guy uh, recovers and comes back stronger uh, next season. Yeah. He, I, I even said he could be part of a trade. If there's some value there, I think yeah. the Leafs might look at it as like, if, a team asked for him in the deal and it made the deal happen. I think it could just, uh, yeah, his value to me on an asset management side, the Leafs are no Vancouver Canucks. So you're not just saucing Robertson away, but on a human yeah. perspective, maybe Dubas looks at it as like, okay, if we can include him in a trade that makes sense for us past this year, like not just for a rental, then maybe Robertson's part of it. But yeah, yeah for me, I've, I've wanted the Robertson story to work. So like, so bad in Toronto. It's just, over and over again he keeps getting injured and it's just it's tough for the player tough for the team so we will see what happens uh but yeah i think lee fans are very resistant on trading uh matt nyes which makes sense uh and if robertson's not getting dealt then it goes back to the conversation we're very likely to see a guy like topi Nimilla traded Mm -hmm. it's it's very likely unless they trade they go back to trading the first round pick which i guess is still possible it's one Uh, or the other has got to go something's got to give yeah. Um, before we close the leaf segment, I do think with them adding a piece from each position or perhaps, you know, two forwards and a defenseman, if they come in at lower cap hits, I think when there's this many bodies coming in, like we were alluding to on the defense, I think a lot of bodies are going to go out even on forward. Like I can see some of these guys in the bottom six, like just getting moved, like, as part of either. Yeah. A I dump mean, try to, to hunt just got on waivers. Yeah. Yeah. Like, or an Aston Reese, like I, maybe you're not getting value back, but just to clear the body or they go on waivers, right. To make room. I think we're going to see big changes um, for the Leafs in the bottom six, uh, as well as, you know, another addition on D I I think they're both going to happen prefer on forward, but we'll see. Do you think it's possible just quickly? Do you think it's possible that they can make it more of like uh, their own formed fourth line? So like Holmberg McMahon, two guys that they've basically like, I I feel like, yeah, like Keith loves these situations, like the Angval situation. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying it's directly comparable, but it's like Holmberg and McMahon, kind of these gems they've found. So, yeah, I mean, do you think maybe that's the form of fourth line they're looking for? Maybe. I, I could see that. I could see that. I think Bobby McMahon, the way he's played, man, you you can't take that guy out. Just how uh, how hungry he is in the forecheck and all of that. Like, he looks he looks dialed in every night. Um, not really a scoring. Yeah, he's not going to add much scoring. Still, a that, little bit. That's the issue. That's the yeah. issue. And that's why I think if you're going to have a McMahon and a Holmberg, maybe you got to add one more piece to kind of bring them up, prop them up a bit offensively. Yeah. Um, but we'll see how it goes. We'll see how the puzzle fits together uh, as we get closer to the deadline. Yeah, so good Leafs chat. Just to talk about another Canadian team, Lucas, and the Calgary Flames. And obviously, they've been a big discussion for us, especially the big move they made and just going into the season. But uh, Daryl Sutter's comments, I know we talked about it uh, crazy on Jacob Pelche. This guy, major sarcasm, probably a little disrespectful, I would say. Personally, for me, I think it was major disrespectful. But guy pulls up the roster and the ice time and just no sense of opinion or care at all. Just completely read off the paper on Jacob Pelche after saying 
what number is he acting like he doesn't know him. So I think as a coach, super disrespectful. I mean, I like Daryl Sutter's personality and I like a lot of what he's done in terms of like on ice hockey, but uh, that was just, I don't know, Lucas, did you feel the disrespect there? Yeah, I thought it was, uh, you know, very, very unnecessary. I think that Daryl Sutter probably, he's one of those coaches who sometimes his tactics really hit and work and other times they don't. I think he's frustrated with the way Calgary's played this season. I mean, no, no one is shocked that they should be higher up in, in, in their own division, yeah. but for a guy playing his first game, John, I mean, just kind of unneeded, right? Like just a bit of a tough, uh, tough comments to read or, or watch after uh, your first NHL game. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's seen those comments and, and people yeah. are reaching out to him about those comments. It's just, it just seems disrespectful. I think at the end of the day, uh, as we're about to transition into this conversation is, is coaches on the watch, like Daryl Sutter has got to be up there. I mean, if the flames somehow miss the playoffs, uh, especially in that Pacific division, I think there's going to be major conversations. Like obviously the Canucks have been the big storyline in that division, but Calgary's looking uh, pretty rough for playoffs right now. They've played 47 games. They have 53 points, which ties for Colorado, but they've got two games in hand. So, I mean, as it stands right now, Colorado and Edmonton uh, would be in the playoffs as the wildcard teams uh, in Calgary. And I know we've talked about the blues a lot, like those two teams, I feel like we had them pretty locked in or at least pretty confident. They were going to be in the playoff spot and, and they're pretty safely out right now. Yeah. Daryl Sutter, even just, just a comment like that too, just adds more fuel to the fire. Your, your job is already like, I'm sure in Calgary, they're evaluating what There's they want to do with coaching. Sure. Yeah. Right. And, and if they need to do a reboot for next season. And so when you see things like that, it's almost like, is this guy like trying to force his way out of here? Like, what is this about? Right. Um, Craig Berube for St. Louis, hundred percent. He's on the hot seat. I think uh, the blues may look to do some sort of revamp and we might see that at the deadline, right. With O'Reilly and Tara Sango coming back from injuries. If those guys are moved on, like mm-hmm. they're expected to, this could be some form of a retool on the fly. And there could be a new coach uh, in St. Louis. Uh, if not by the end of the season, by start of next season. So that one wouldn't surprise me, but John, as far as coaches shifting, I think a lot of the coach, a lot of the teams at the bottom of, of the league are pretty safe for the most part, because this was the yeah. expectations coming in, right? Yeah. Like the only one I would say, and, and yeah. we just talked about them because their expectations were so high, but they are towards the bottom is I think DJ Smith is on heavy, heavy hot seat. I've seen sense fans just losing it on them. Uh, and they've been kind of doing some chance to get him fired. So uh is there anyone else that's like to the DJ Smith level? Like, I feel like if the Sens don't turn the season around, like they're not that, like, as I just said, it's very unlikely that they can turn it around, but three wins and they're back to 500. So it's kind of like, I, I still think the expectations were just too high for a team that hasn't shown anything, at least in recent memory. Yeah. I, I, I don't see that one. Um, I just I don't, is there I any, don't, is there any others? I'm trying to I was think. thinking of John Hines for Nashville, but he's just, re, he just signed last season. So I, I feel like that might be a bit of a rush to, to well, and I go. feel like in the central, how tough it's been. Like, I feel like they're 22, 18 and six right now, 50 yeah. points of 46 games. The fact that they're only three points back at the abs. Like I feel like, yeah, kind of what you said about Ruby. I feel like the blues will be facing much more criticism. Cause I don't think Nashville was expected to make playoffs or at least be a contender. Yeah, um, I think Nashville Nashville's expectations coming in were probably a, a bubble pretty team. Pretty mediocre, that, yeah. That should probably make it, but you never know. Where St. Louis, I think, was picked by a lot of a lot of people to uh, be a top three division team, right? Yeah, outside of that, I mean, Columbus, uh, maybe some people had them as a hot take team, but they weren't expected to be great. Uh, the Flyers were expected to be bad. Uh, the Blackhawks were expected to be bad. The Coyotes were expected to be bad. San Jose and uh, Anaheim. So those teams, mm-hmm. as you kind of said, towards the bottom, they're pretty safe. Uh, but I would mm-hmm. say everyone in terms of uh, who you're looking out for, DJ Smith, definitely on the watch. Craig Berube. I would say even Daryl Sutter of Calgary missed the playoffs. Yep, and absolutely. any others? Is that our top three? I know I mean, some people have yeah. thrown out Lane Lambert with the Islanders a bit, but... Yeah, I, well, and in a world where Edmonton, if Edmonton was to miss the playoffs, God, God forbid. I mean, look out there, right? Yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, the Oilers, Lucas, if I'm, I'm like, I'd be, I'm being honest. Like, I think they're going to yeah. make it hundred percent because I just yeah. think that Pacific is so tight. Like, they're only three points back of top of the division. <laughs> like, yeah. that's crazy. It's crazy. So you're right. I think we'll keep seeing that Pacific division flip flop uh, between those five teams. I would say. But in terms of I had to put like 
a bet down right now. I'm still confident the Golden Knights and Oilers will be two of those top three teams. I'm still very confident, but, I, hey, but I, I've been I, wrong I feel, many times. <laughs> I feel that way too. When I see Colorado in eighth uh, in, in the conference, obviously in the second wild card, when I see Colorado there, I just, it would be miraculous for them not to make the playoffs that I see them there. And it's almost just a joke. Like I, I don't, I don't take them seriously as a team that will miss. So that leaves everybody that's outside looking in right now in a real tough spot for me. Uh, yeah. Calgary, if they're to get in, like who are they knocking out? Right. Is, is really. Well, what's is crazy is like, I know people talk point percentage, so I'm not going based on points, point percentage right now, but it's like, there's a world where Vegas and Edmonton play in the first round. Yeah. And I think that would be nuts. But there's also a world where, where I just said, like I, I said, I think last week or the week before it was like, damn, like, I wanted that other battle of Alberta and it seems like it's not going to happen this year, but in a world where Edmonton gets back into the division spot in Calgary strings, a couple of games, like we're back to that uh, battle of Alberta conversation, but Seattle continues to be a, a team. That's just, they're buzzing. Man. <laughs> they're me, it's buzzing kind of, man. Kind of nowhere, but their offensive depth is insane. Like Tanev was playing so well for them and he's back on the fourth line and they have one of the best, like third lines in hockey, one of the best fourth lines in hockey, um, man, you put that, bottom six of Seattle in Toronto. Oh my, I don't even think we're talking about an addition made, like <laughs> get ready for the playoffs. Absolutely, man. I watch a lot of their games, actually funny enough. Like I will hop on late at night and watch those cracking games. And a lot of it is to hear. <laughs> it's funny to say it. a lot of it is to hear their, their goal commentary with the, Hey, Hey, what yeah. do you say? Or the, or the, what's the, what's the other one? Oh, what's this guy? Johnny, do you know this guy's name off by heart? Uh, I'm trying to put you on the about? spot. It's it's the guy that calls all the cracking games, and it's that's hockey, baby. Oh, you're talking about John Forsland. Yeah, yeah John, bro, unbelievable. Like he he makes me want to watch cracking games. I'm serious. Like I have watched over a dozen cracking games this year just for that. Right? Yeah, I thought um, you were referring to like a mascot or like a personality or something. Yeah, no, no, no. John, John Forsland. That was like John one Forsland. of the best decisions they made, bringing him in as the the franchise came through. Yeah, John Forsland. He's probably one of my. It's probably one of my favorites right now. I, I wouldn't say all yeah. time, but just, yeah, the energy he brings. And I like it announcers or commentators that like always, I mean, we've always had the Joe Bowen, Holy Mackinac. I love commentators yeah. that like have their own things, like have their own Our lines, have yeah. their own catchphrase. Yeah. Uh, it just makes them a little bit more recognizable or iconic. Like, I, I feel like a lot of hockey fans, like, like that's what you recognize them from. Not maybe not even his name. <laughs> that's how you recognize them. So. Uh, yeah. No, that's pretty cool. But yeah, the Kraken have been a great story. I do want them to make the playoffs. Um, to be honest, and sorry, I was actually going to rep the Kings jersey for this uh, episode, but I just threw on the Panthers because uh, just uh, just repping the Atlantic a little bit. But, well, it's almost, buddy, it's almost All Star Weekend, and you're yeah. wearing the Panthers jersey. There yeah, you go. There you go. There's the tie-in. <laughs> so, but what I was going to say is no, no shot against the Kings. But if I had my I, ideal Pacific Division matchups going to the playoffs, I'd want. The two and three spots to be Edmonton, Calgary. Let Seattle drop to that first wildcard spot and have the two expansion teams play against each other, Seattle and Vegas. That would be unreal. Give me those matchups. And then the other side too, you could have Dallas, Colorado, Winnipeg, Minnesota. Winnipeg and Minnesota, like over the years, they've been there's a little rivalry going there. A little bit. Absolutely. I don't yeah, yeah, there is, man. I don't know about as much as the Leafs, but uh yeah, no, Winnipeg has no. got Winnipeg's got a rivalry with Minnesota too. Winnipeg just they're just such a snarly team, man. I yeah. feel like they get they get under a lot of team skins. So and Winnipeg, um, I mean they're like I said, they're they're big. Like they have big guys on that team up front. And oh yeah. Uh, Minnesota's got some threats like Felino, Ryan Reeves, Greenway. Like there'd be some freaking haymakers thrown in that series. <laughs> Or even like in general, that central conference or central division, I mean, is like even Dallas, man. I feel like Dallas will be so pesky in the playoffs. Like I'm excited for playoffs. I mean, I am every year, but. Yeah, we're looking at, uh, I mean, we're staring in the face some nice matchups. I I hope that happens. What you just said, man. Battle of Alberta and then a battle of the expansion teams. That's must see TV, right? Yeah, I hope that's, I hope that goes down. Um, Yeah, because I think LA Kings fans, I feel like you can wait until San Jose and Anaheim catches up and then we can have the California rivalries in the playoffs again. Those yeah, are those underrated. Were awesome. Those were so awesome. And I hate that they were so underrated because uh, those rivalries were as good as any. So absolutely. Well, let's hope that Bedard goes to actually, I was talking about it the other day is uh, Anaheim Bedard and Anaheim with Zegris and uh, McTavish. Pff, imagine, but I honestly, I'll leave my take. I do want Bedard in San Jose. I think I, I still stand by that. 
I like that one. I like that one a lot. Yeah. Um, I I wouldn't mind Columbus because I, I like I had said I wouldn't I wouldn't show. mind Columbus either. I, yeah. I, I like the like the Rick Nash feel of that first overall guy that comes in and like, like puts the franchise on his back. And this is obviously not even just a superstar. This is a generational player. Um, I think he would bring Columbus a, a lot of a lot of season oh, tickets. Bedard with Line and yeah. Goudreau would be one oh, of the yeah. best. Yeah, yeah, that would be sick. But but yeah, I love I love San Jose. I love California as a whole as far as the state goes and everything that they bring. So that would be awesome, Bedard in, in uh, California, whether it's San Jose or Anaheim. Yeah. So I think that about wraps it up. But just in terms of Columbus, the conversation, Goudreau returning to Calgary. Uh, I know a lot of you will probably be listening or watching after the fact. Uh, but just quickly, your opinion, based on what we don't know yet, do you think it should be a nice reception or do you think some fans might be a little aggressive? I think he's going to get both. I, I, I don't want to sound like a fence sitter. but So not to I, the Tavares level, though. No, 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 no. I think he'll get his his dues before the game um, or when they do the tribute, I guess, during the game. Um, but he's going to get some boobers as well, Johnny. Let's not let's not forget what he uh, what he did uh, leaving the club, uh, leaving his uh, drafted team. I think he's going to get some boos. But Tavares is a, there's nothing like John Tavares is. I don't think we're going to see again for a very long time. That was that was uh, hostile, very very hostile. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and oh, I hope he tucks tonight, by the way. I hope yeah, he scores. I hope he I know. That's yeah. a nice skull prop to put down if you're, yeah. if you're looking, but yeah, I was also just going to say, talking about guys leaving their teams or, or missing to certain guys, Hyman, man, Hyman first point per game season over a point per game season. Lucas, I don't think there's any Leaf fan that's looking at, like, I'm sorry, looking back at that, especially now the extra additions and guys have grown into the team. It's like the money that went towards Kerfoot and Angville could be Mr. Zach Hyman right there, eh? Yeah, I remember it always being about that he wasn't going to age gracefully. Um, but he's just getting better. I think it, it's a it's a credit to his perseverance, work ethic, work ethic yeah. all of that stuff, right? I mean, but he, the way he plays the game, it just doesn't seem like this is going to be able to age gracefully. I still think the second better. half of the contract will be not like it'll, it'll be kind of rough, maybe. But yeah, but but he is. Man, You're getting he, that that now. <laughs> he's scoring. He he's scoring thirty plus this year. He's on pace to score forty. Right. He he is gonna he is gonna have his best season by far. Um, and you know, people who watch from afar could say, well, he had Matthews, and now he's got McDavid and Drysaitel. But you, if you watch Zach Hyman, you know how valuable he is to a team and how much his teammates love him for the work yep. that he does. And so, I mean, hey, if we're going back to hypotheticals and what ifs, Bunting, Matthews, Nylander, Hyman, Tavares, Marner, but. I remember, I do remember <laughs> hearing about this, but man, the Leafs, the Leafs don't bring in bunting and develop bunting like they have if they have Zach Hyman. I, I don't, I don't think so at least. But that's well, a one. Now, now bunting's going to need a contract. <laughs> so you're back, you're yeah. back to where you were with Hyman. <laughs> bunting needs kinda, a contract. I think you are. Uh, 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 Hyman, surely his deal is going to be more expensive than what bunting ends up getting though. Yeah, my prediction I was, I think bunting will be. Um, I think they'll try to lock him long term. Yeah, four million per. Four million per. That's what I think Dubis is going to try to aim for. Because I think at at all, like they were always trying to lock in Hyman under four, mm -hmm. and I think Hyman's value is higher than Bunting's. Mm -hmm. So I think they're not going to make that same mistake. If Bunting wants four, four point five, they'll give it to him. I don't think they'll ever get to five, but around mm -hmm. that four range, they'll probably try to get the years up so the cap goes down. So that would be my prediction. Yeah. Yeah. And tough, you're <laughs> like you said, you're back. <laughs> at, you're, well, you're back at square one where it's, you really got to think about, is that worth it? Right. And yeah. is that going to age properly? Um, but I'm, I'm happy for Zach Hyman. Um, I'm, I'm happy for the guy. And, and going back to when he came up with the Leafs originally, a lot of people like, don't like to give this guy the credit he deserves, but Mike Babcock really believed in that player and really gave him the opportunity to succeed. And I think, um, that's where Zach Hyman popped off from the opportunity. Yeah. He got. No, you're right. Babcock right? did a lot of negative, but he was the driving force of for Zach Hyman. bringing up Hyman and leaving Hyman right next to Matthews and Nylander. There was a lot of Leaf fans screaming from the ceiling that Zach Hyman doesn't have the skill to play with Matthews or in the top six in general, yeah. or you know. And look what he is now, man. He's uh, ex exceptional. The way the guy's grown from a fifth round pick that Florida traded away for peanuts. I mean, good on him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. 
Hyman, all the best to you in Edmonton. I, I'm hoping the <laughs> Leafs can make it farther than those than those guys over there. I I like Edmonton. Don't get me wrong, but the fans have been on my ass lately. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys, right. Lucas. Anything else you want to just throw in at the end here? I think next week, John, we should look at uh, some of the All Star competitions and stuff, and maybe poke in on that. Maybe uh, with, predictions. With, yeah. Yeah. With with All Star Weekend coming. Yeah. So maybe up. guys reach out to us. Quick predictions, comments on yeah, that. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, um, yeah, sort of that. We'll keep chatting traded line. We'll keep chatting uh, standings. We'll keep chatting teams in what direction, coaches, all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, trade deadline chat. I would say as we move this podcast into February, we're going to be heating up with trade deadline talks oh, a month yeah. leading into the deadline. So thank you guys for listening, watching. Make sure if you haven't yet, follow Spotify, Apple, rate us well. Uh, give us some feedback, uh, watch on YouTube, hit us up on social media, Lucas, John, this was episode 22 of the hot take hockey podcast. Hope you have a great one. See you soon. Peace, Peace. out.